Dr. Parker, if I could turn to you and ask you to explain just some of the imagery, first of all, what is it really talking about with the shepherd and the sheep and the experience and so forth? This is one of those times when I really wish everyone who is on this call that we could chat together because we are a worldwide audience and we all come with different experiences of the land and different pictures that come up in our heads when we hear things like shepherds and green pastures and quiet waters. And I mean, I'd love even just throw something in the chat as to what image comes to your mind. But when I teach this class at Israel Bible Center, it's called Listening to the Land of the Bible. And it's, um, it's there because I think the land is a character in the text, and we just don't always pay attention to it, but I think it is necessary for us to pay attention to. And this psalm is one that lends itself to great examples of why it is so important to listen to the land and to actually know the real context of where this psalm was written. So for example, when I grew up, this picture on the screen is what I had in my head for this psalm. And so if you're thinking about the importance of images and how images will transform your theology or at least influence your theology, if you are like me and if you grew up with pictures of Psalm 23, thinking something like this, these lush, green, amazing fields, you think, okay, even just in the first one or two verses, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If you're thinking, I shall not want, looks like this picture, then the way it transforms your theology is you start thinking of your role as the sheep. And you think God's role as the shepherd is just to get me into this kind of context where I have everything that I could ever want, where there's lush green fields. And, and in this kind of context, if you think those are the quiet waters, that's green pasture, then you think, what's the role of the shepherd? Well, the role of the shepherd just seems to be to get you where you are going to be comfortable, where you can lie down and you know, you just, you get to hang out and get fat and eat and be super merry and wonderful. But if we go on to the next slide, and if I were to say, what is the actual context of where David, let's say David was writing the Psalm, but any shepherd, any um, Israelite shepherd who is writing the Psalm and Shia, I don't think I can advance the slides. Can you advance it one more slide? and show you the actual context. This is where shepherds hung out in ancient Israelite times, right? This is the Judean wilderness, say, um, or the hills of Samaria, which look very similar. And we start to now transform the actual context, our understanding of the context of writing a psalm like this. And now it changes your theology because now when you ask those questions of, what is your role as a sheep and what is the shepherd's role? Everything is transformed. So for example, now we start looking at that landscape and you think the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want in that kind of landscape. It just elevates what it is that the shepherd is actually doing. And he makes me lie down in green pastures. Well, that image that is on the screen, that's really, really, really green for where shepherds would take their sheep. And so suddenly you start to realize, oh, even green pastures are a little bit rough. And then you start to look at the larger landscape and you see, oh, this is really harsh terrain. It's dangerous terrain. In this kind of terrain, there are all, all kinds of dangerous animals that can kill you. And suddenly, your understanding of even just the first two verses of this psalm is transformed because what is your role as a sheep? Well, it's to get up and follow the shepherd because if you lay down in a pasture like this, which is hardly a pasture for modern vocabulary, um, you're going to die. The environment is going to kill you. So it underscores the necessity for you to get up and consistently and perpetually follow the shepherd. 
Well, now you can also ask, what's the role of the shepherd? And suddenly, instead of the role of the shepherd being just to get you to that lush terrain where you can be lazy and you can eat and you're satisfied, suddenly you realize the protective leadership quality of the shepherd and how crucial the role of the shepherd is to protect the flock, to be mindful of how much they've eaten, to continuously move them, to be aware of the terrain and always scanning the horizon line for something that is dangerous. So this is why in my class, I I always start with what is the geographical context? What is the land going to tell us? And how does that help us interpret not just the words on the page, but the sentiment and the theology that is being explained in the Psalm? So I think being able to do a little bit of homework to look at the context in the Bible takes a two-dimensional, really rich, really beautiful and wonderful text, but it, it takes this two-dimensional text and makes it three-dimensional and multicolor and rich and full of so much information that when you then dump that into your context, it's just incredibly beautiful and wonderful. So I think doing the initial homework is massively important and beneficial. So homework, doing homework is always good. Is that, uh, is that right? That's Cindy? right. So as a good teacher, right? I think yes. as a teacher, I have to say that. Well, um, just to round out that theme, you know, here are a couple of comments or questions from the very beginning of the seminar. And I hope these people are still patiently waiting for the answer. Again, I apologize that we can't get to every question. Um, looks like there are about 450 plus that have come in. Um, but Mark said, um, Shalom, glad to be joining. I wonder if the panel have any thoughts on the additions to Psalm 23 in the Passion Translation, i.e. the Lord is my shepherd and my best friend. And then apparently there are some other added uh, sentences in verses 5 and 6. Now, I'm not per personally familiar with this translation, but I think that's an interesting example of the kind of paraphrases that, you know, some versions uh, allow themselves. And then Paul was asking, what is the importance of Psalm 23 to the contemporary reader? How should the Psalm be read for maximum benefit? And I think these questions kind of go together. Uh, probably the translators who added that in are trying to give maximum benefit to the contemporary reader or something like that. And I think it's also relevant to what Cindy was just saying about, you know, doing your homework and understanding that it, it does apply, but it's not written specifically to you in your setting. Um, any thoughts about any additional thoughts about this, Nick or Tupa? Uh, I think that one important part is that those different translations, uh, as far as we are aware, that they are um, contemporary in inter interactions with the text. Uh, if we are aware that of that, then it's amazing that we have them because they can open different ways of interpretation then they can help people in the moment that you are struggling to connect with the text especially if you have like a translation that's very that's very old and have a very um like pompous language sometimes it's hard to connect to a text like that so i do feel that's amazing that we have different versions of translations and especially if we were we are aware that those are uh, added things and that we don't take them as the original text and every translation none no translation will be exactly as the original text because the original text will be uh, in another language and also because we don't have the specific original text we have versions that we use and that are more accepted uh, but I think it's great that we have different ways of seeing the text and interacting with the text. I think the text for being a poetry allows that flexibility. And then I'm saying that everything counts and that you can do whenever you want with the text. But for personal use, I think it you can allow yourself to connect with the text in different ways. Thank you for that, Tupa. And I'm going to go to Nick next and i know what he's gonna say but i'll ask him anyway the lord is my shepherd and my best friend um 
<laughs> yeah, just to just to but just to add to that, Nick, because yeah. there's another set of questions somewhat related. <laughs> okay. Um, in John 10, yeah, there's a particular statement by Jesus, I am the good shepherd. Yeah. Is it related mm -hmm. to this psalm? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, th th those are one of several I am statements, ego Amy in Greek from John, uh, John's Jesus, Jesus in John, however you want to put it. Uh, I am X, Y, Z. I am the door. I am the gate. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. Uh, I think that the good shepherd language is drawing on this and other materials in the Bible, like, for example, Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 34, all these texts where God is pictured as a, a good shepherd. Um, and John's Jesus in particular is, you know, is with God and is God. So, uh, yeah, the, the, John's drawing on this language in John 10. Uh, as far as my best friend stuff, I agree with Tupa, actually, that, that these, are, these are nice to have as long as you know what's going on. As long as you know that my best friend is not in the actual text. And as long as a paraphrastic translation is not the only translation you have on your shelf, get a real one. And I do mean that uh, sort of pejoratively. Get a real translation. Um, you can have like a different paraphrase if you want, but just know that that's not really what the Bible says. I'm I'm very um, what's the word zealous for the text. Um, anyone who's you know hung out with me enough over these webinars will know that. Uh, so I don't love the idea. The only people who can add, in my view, are the Aramaic translators who did the Targums in the ancient world. But that's a completely different uh, webinar. Um, you know, best friend, I don't know, why not like, and God is my, you know, is my shepherd and my redeemer, because that's what God is doing in this text. A friend is like, yeah, come on over and kibitz and, you know, I'll make you some whatever little sandwiches or whatever. That's what a friend, a best friend does. That's fine. But like here, like God is redeeming an exiled individual. God is overturning the abandoned feeling this person has. I mean, I don't know, is Superman, if Superman saved me from a burning building, is Superman my best friend? I mean, maybe who Superman would hang out with me afterwards. That would be great. But that's not the main point of the salvation here. The main point is it's not just a best friend. Like we'll get through this pal. It's like, I'm going to, I'm going to ensure that I don't let that your enemies don't attack you. I'm going to ensure that you get saved from your horrible situation of the shadow of death or however we want to translate that term. Uh, this Psalm is so forceful. And I guess part of what I'm trying to do with these translational changes and shifting a little bit into the actual Hebrew is to say, yeah, it, it's like a comforting little thing to us now, but this is not, this is like a real, this is a tough, forceful, strong piece of writing. And I want to keep it that way. I confess, I expected a lot of different things to come up in this conversation. Uh, Superman was not one of them. But uh, well I'm done. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm not a superhero person. That's the only I'll see superhero I could come up with. So it it really illustrates, um, you know, how we have to look at the psalm from different angles to try to understand what's going on. Shalom, friends. Dr. Eli Lizorkin Eisenberg is here for you with great news. Today we introduce our new seven-day tuition-free trial for you to study with Israel. Bible Center. That's right, you heard me right. This is seven day, a whole week of studying before you pay any of tuition at all. You will now be able to see for yourself what is the Certificate in Jewish Context and Culture program. You will get over 45 crash courses on variety of Jewish context and culture topics. You will be granted access to more than 55 roundtable talks with world-leading scholars of Jewish background of New Testament and the Hebrew Bible. You will truly be surprised at the value you're going to receive from studying at Israel Bible Center. You've got nothing to lose, so go ahead and click on the link, sign up for your seven free tuition days of trial.